Hello everyone, welcome to PMFIS Current Affairs Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your part number 4 of the third test that we conducted. Now this, in this video we are going to discuss the next 20 questions that is 61 to question number 80. But before we begin, now this is, uh, this is a very important announcement for all the UPSC aspirants. So if you guys are serious about taking some quality test series for the upcoming prelims, now here is your chance to get that 1000 high quality MCQs at just Rs 499 prepared by the team of experts at the PMF IES. The link is given in the description below. It's a limited time offer. Before it expires, just go and check out the, the special price and prepare your upcoming prelims with the, with the high quality MCQs. Okay, the link is in the description below. <clears throat> The 61st question of the series of the of the test number three was with respect to two very important uh, uh, you know uh, procedures that we have in the Parliament of India. So if you look at the first procedure, now the the very first procedure talks about it's not propagation, it is prorogation. It's a spelling error. It is prorogation. So prorogation and adjournment, right? Now these are the two very very important. Uh, I would say uh, these are the two instruments that I'm sure you must have heard if you have seen any of the parliamentary discussion um, you know that happens uh, in our country. What is adjournment? What is prorogation? Now these two are important tools in the parliamentary procedure. This question was with respect to that. But here in the question there was a problem because the two are actually interchanged if you know the real meaning. So what exactly is the meaning of the adjournment? Now this is, this is probably even very common that you have heard that the house is adjourned. You must have seen the speaker or the chairman uh, doing saying this, that the house is adjourned for, you know, for, for, for some particular hour or particular day or maybe particular week. So the word adjournment is used as a suspension of the proceedings of the, of the house for some particular time period, for some number of hour, days or week. It is, it is more like a temporary uh, suspending or temporarily holding the, the proceedings. It is more of a temporary in nature, right? Now, every time, whenever uh, the, you know, there is end of that parliament's business, the, at the end of the parliamentary day, the presiding officer always adjourn the house, but at the same time, he also announces the date and the hour that when the next meeting is going to get commenced. Normal adjournment, you always have to mention, okay, the house is adjourned now. Now again we are going to meet at so and so date and so and so time. So that is mandatory with respect to the adjournment. Okay, because it's a temporary suspension. You have to give clarity when we are going to meet the next time. But at the same time, there is another word called as adjourned adjournment sine die. Now this particular word if you hear adjournment of the house sine die. Sine die means for indefinite period. This is for the sake of indefinite period. There is no clue when we are going to meet again that is always done after prorogation now what exactly prorogation means word prorogation means the end of the session of course not the end of the parliament parliament is a, is it's a continuous house it's not going to end but whenever we use the word prorogation it is it means the end of the session now please remember that adjournment that we have seen the adjournment is done by the presiding officer it is always done by the presiding officer. It can be speaker in the case of the Lok Sabha, can be the chairperson in the case of the Rajya Sabha. But the word prorogation, it is declared by the President of India. President of India has this power of summoning and prorogation of the houses. The session is terminated only by prorogation and never ever by adjournment because prorogation is more permanent in nature and adjournment is more temporary in nature as I told you, right? This is important. So these two, three comparisons are very important. Now, if you look at the question, the question was actually the inter exchange meaning of the two. So it says adjournment, adjournment is that suspension of the proceedings for some particular time period. So it has to be, this one has to be the correct and prorogation is the end of the session or the parliament. So two are actually exchange. This question was easy because uh, prorogation, adjournment, these are very common uh, terms whenever you are preparing for the Indian polity. These are very uh, common terms. And moreover, adjournment is something which is very much in the news. Especially, you know, the way sometimes opposition interrupts the, uh, the you know, the procedures. So speaker always say, okay, the house is adjourned. And one more thing, uh, one more thing is important in this proceeding. 
that is sometimes house is also adjourned due to lack of quorum this is an important word what is the meaning of lack of quorum quorum is basically there has to be minimum at least there has to be 10 percent of the members available present there has to be 10 percent attendance like for example if it is a Lok Sabha Lok Sabha has 543 seats let's say right now so it has to be at least 55 person has to be present in the house for carrying out the proceedings so it is actually 110 10 percent um, uh, you know attendance has to be compulsory otherwise the house cannot be carried forward so if you don't have that 10 percent attendance then also the house is adjourned okay now this is important question very straightforward uh, i would say this is an easy question and uh, everyone must have attempted this uh, just be careful about the adjournment and adjournment sine die because adjournment sine die always come after prorogation okay every time you president does the prorogation it is always followed by adjournment sine die that is the house is uh, you know it is adjourned for indefinite period now these two three procedures are important for parliamentary uh, uh, meetings the next question was a very important question with respect to the map uh, marking or in geography right talks about the caucasus mountains where exactly caucasus mountains are now please um, try to recall because whenever you talk about eurasia you have this word called as eurasia which is europe and asia and there are some natural barriers which actually separates europe and asia so you must have heard of the ural mountains right separating the europe and asian uh, uh, part of uh, russia then you have these caucasus mountains caucasus mountains are again separating europe and asia and then you have two important water bodies one is the caspian sea and another is the black sea so these three four are basically these three four are the natural barriers or natural separation uh, which is done by these mountains and this water bodies they separate europe and asia very factual very simple question plus one interesting point about the Cas the caucasus mountain is that uh, uh, based on the name caucasus there is also uh, there is an ethnic ethnicity called caucasoids the people of this region is called the caucasoid people like indian the north indian people are called the brown caucasoids you know so uh, these caucasoid ethnicity the whole race is named after these particular mountains so it's very important in terms of the cultural history of humanity the right answer has to be a very easy uh, if you if you if you know the basics of uh, the map you can you can easily solve and caucasus is one of the very important mountain range uh, that we have between europe and asia one interesting point looking at the location even caucasus mountains are of two categories one is the greater caucasus another is the lesser caucasus in the greater caucasus mountains you have the highest mountain peak which is mount elbrus if you can see on the map here this is mount elbrus this is the location of mount elbrus this is the highest peak that we have in the caucasus mountains and it particularly lies in the russia now in this particular area you have small portion that is uh, held by russian uh, territory and there you have the mount elbrus very important and look at the sea you have the Caspian Black Sea. These are also natural separating, uh, uh, you know, bodies of Asia and Europe. Then the next question is probably one of the, the most important and very, very simple question of this test. Because this is something we have, we know from the childhood days. You have the tricolor of our national flag and which color indicates what particular meaning. I mean, you don't need any key for that. Indian saffron is about the strength and the courage, white represents peace and the truth and indian green represents the fertility growth auspiciousness of the land so probably uh, this is the most uh, question easy i mean very easy question and everyone must have given the right answer i mean this cannot go wrong if this must not go wrong i would say right now one thing i would i would like to uh, mention here whenever you're talking about the the national flag of india please be careful about one important point and that is that for the for the using and how you are going you can use your flag there are certain uh, you know rules and regulations with respect to the usage of the flag of india and every use of the indian flag is actually governed by two very important uh, code and flag uh, act we have the flag code of india and there is prevention of insult to national honor act now you may have this question that with respect to the national flag which particular uh, regulations do we have so these two are very very important uh, uh, you know things that we always refer whenever there is any dispute with respect to the use of national flag 
Question 64 was again a very a straightforward question. There you have the three very famous cases. They are very famous three cases and then you have Supreme Court judgments on that. Like Berubari Union case was 1960 and this particular case was with respect to that preamble where the Supreme Court said, very controversial thing it was, that preamble is not a part of the constitution. This is what uh, Supreme Court has said in 1960 Berubari case. But then Supreme Court reviewed its own judgment. In fact, it has changed the whole stance with the Keshavanand Bharti case, very landmark case in 1973. It was the Keshavanand Bharti case where we got uh, the basic structure of the constitution. The concept of the basic structure of the constitution emerged from this judgment. And there they have said that preamble is definitely part of the constitution. So first and second are wrong because you, you can see the both are interchanged. The third statement is correct here. We have the union government LIC case. Here Supreme Court once again said that the preamble is an integral part of the constitution. So remember, try to remember all these cases. Other than these three, you have the Goloknath case that is again very important. You have Minavra Mills case that is again very important. So these are Indra Sahani judgment, you know, Nagarjun uh, judgment. So these are very, very important cases that you uh, that you have to keep in the mind while going for the UPSC prelims because uh, these landmark Supreme Court judgments are sometimes asked directly in the exam, right? So here in this case, there is only one pair which is correct. This was also a very easy question because every case is a famous case, should have attempted without any problem. Now in the third case, uh, the, the LIC case, try to remember one thing specially. Though the Supreme Court said the preamble is an integral part of the constitution, but in 1995, that was a case of 1995, but in this LIC case, Supreme Court also said that preamble is not directly enforceable in the court of justice. Now this is a star condition which was added in 1995. So also keep that thing into mind with the LIC case. The next question 65 is with respect to the G7 summit, one of the most important group. Uh, G7 is about the most developed, most industrialized countries that we have, probably one of the richest uh, countries that we have uh, as a G7. Now what exactly G7 member will talk about that. The question is with respect to that. Now please uh, uh, just look at the G7 thing. What is G7 stands for group of seven. So basically this, um, uh, this is an international forum. G7 summit is an international forum which is held annually. Something you have to remember. It takes place every year. G7 members, they are the, they are responsible for uh, holding this G7 summit. But at the same time, even European Union is also a member that also take place regularly. Though please remember European Union is not a member of G7. G European Union is not at all a member of G7. G7 is about the seven most industrialized and developed economies that we have today. This group G7 group was actually established in 1975 and what exactly these most industrialized country try to remember them continent wise. So two countries from uh, from the North America we have Canada and then we have the USA. Now four countries we have from the European uh, group. So from Europe we have UK, we have France and we also have Germany and we have the Italy. So these four. Now you can remember these four uh, because these are the four major countries that took place in the world war, isn't it? So the four, four most important countries of the world war were these four countries only. And with respect to world war, you have one very important country of Asia, that is Japan. So if you, if you uh, remember the world war, if you have a bit of knowledge of world war, it becomes easy for you to remember all the seven countries. They are most industrialized, most developed uh, economies. So uh, that take G7 take place every year. But European Union is just a regular, uh, you know, participant, not a member. This is important. Well, G7 established 1997. It was actually expanded. It became G8 in 1998 because G8 was when G7, the Russia was added into G7. So Russia became a part of G7 in 1998. But in 2014, Russia was again excluded from the group. The time Russia annexed Crimea, the very integral part of, of the Ukraine in that time. So after the Crimea and uh, invasion, Russia was kicked out from the group and G7, G8 again became G7. This is important. Now please remember one thing. India is also not a member of G7, but 
from 2000 since 2003 india takes part as a special guest india attends g7 as a special guest but of course india is also not a member it is just about the most industrialized and developed economies keep this thing into mind about g7 and you will never ever go wrong uh, further telling you about g7 it is important because um, this very recent g7 took place in uh, hiroshima this two 2023 version was with respect to uh, the location was hiroshima and japan and this time g7 is very very important why it is so important because this time the g7 countries they very focusly called upon the development and adoption of artificial intelligence to make it more trustworthy this time g7 summit was with respect to the ai the major core topic was how the ai is going to to be made more trustworthy how we can make it more human friendly and how we are going we are not going to make uh, ai as a challenge of human race right so g7 countries took this initiative of making ai more trustworthy that was the core of a g7 uh, summit 2023 and let's say if you have a question hiroshima ai process this is this is what we have adopted as a g7 uh, 2023 so let's say if you have this question mcq coming on that what is hiroshima ai it is an intergovernmental forum to debate issues around the fast growing ai tools and this was adopted in g7 summit of 2023 so be prepared uh, the question may come specifically from 2023 g7 summit because this was a landmark one now if you look at the question the question seems very uh, okay so first statement is absolutely correct we have g7 member and european union as a, a participants of this but please remember is european union a member no it is not a member it's just a as a as a participant it comes it is not a member so answer has to be a this is an this is a very easy question uh, everyone must have attempted it because g7 is something which which is in news for so many reasons it always stays in news for one reason or the other the next question we have is with respect to the ASEAN now talking about the ASEAN as the name look at the full form ASEAN stands for Association of Southeast Asian Nations okay now this question now look at the statement number two first since we are talking about Southeast Asian nations we know about the ASEAN ASEAN is one of the most important and very popular group of the 10 member countries there are 10 southeast asian countries that have they have formed this particular group this group was established 1967 in bangkok and that's why that's why uh, it, it is about the bangkok declaration so you may have a direct mcq from this also in in sometimes in the match the following kind of thing they give you this that you know bangkok declaration belongs to what so bangkok declaration belongs to asia now look at the second statement very very with a very common sense you can straight away eliminate the statement number two how do you think india is a member of southeast asia no india as a country as a geographical entity we are part of south asia we are not part of southeast asia we are south asia south asean is all about southeast asian nations india is a member of sark yes which is specifically for south asian uh, association for regional cooperation we are part of BIMSTEC. BIMSTEC is something we have five members of the SARC and two members of the ASEAN. It's a, it's a club. It's a club of both uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Because in BIMSTEC, you have two Southeast Asian countries, namely Myanmar and Thailand. And five countries are from South Asia, including India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. So it's a combination of South Asia and Southeast Asia. But India being a part of Southeast Asia make no sense because we are a country of South Asia. No, how, how we are going to be a part of Southeast Asian country. So this, though we are a close partner, though we have very good trade relations, there is a close cooperation, but we are not a member of that. And forget about becoming a founding member at all. So second statement is clearly wrong. Now the only option I have, it can be neither or it can be A. The answer here was A because Bangkok declaration is quite famous with respect to the ASEAN establishment. This question was again easy and should have been attempted by every one of you. To talk more about the ASEAN, please remember that ASEAN, though it was established uh, uh, you know, uh, by, through the Bangkok declaration, its secretariat are in Jakarta in Indonesia. Every year you have ASEAN leadership rotation 
like uh, with respect to the alphabetical order of the name of the countries so alphabetically every country has a chance to become the leader of the asean and on on an annual basis right 2026 philippines is going to take the command of the leadership though it was actually planned for myanmar but given the situation of myanmar right now uh, th we have seen the kind of uh, military coup that happened in the myanmar now philippines is going to take up the chair in 2026 so now you have uh, now you to just to remember now these are the 10 countries of the asean just try to keep them in mind five of them are more land centric countries myanmar thailand cambodia laos and vietnam laos is the only landlocked country in this group okay it's a only landlocked country you have no open ocean boundary with respect to laos and then five are the maritime partners including malaysia singapore indonesia Burundi, and philippines these are five i should change the color actually so philippines Burundi, malaysia singapore and indonesia these five are maritime partners more of a maritime nature so try to remember the these groups so it is important to read about asean <coughs> read about sark read about bimstrek they're very important groups question number 67 was with respect to the g20 summit now you try to read everything possible for g20 why because g20 is right now in in present situation it is the most important group that we have geopolitically today probably this time geopolitically nothing is more important than g20 it becomes even more relevant for our upsc exam because india hosted its first g20 summit you know india this was the very first time india hosted g20 summit so definitely first statement is correct and that make upsc uh, UPSC's favorite topic into the G20 summit because this is something happening for the first time and so big, so grand happened uh, into that, right? Now, first statement is absolutely correct. And yes, because India hosted this time G20. So, of course, our prime minister is the current G20 chairman. That makes all the sense. Second statement can uh, is also true because, you know, uh, during this G20 summit, lots of lots of new initiatives took place. And logically, if you think about the Global Biofuel Alliance, this has to be correct because India is, India itself is giving so much uh, importance to the biofuels. So probably, even if you have to guess, if, if, even if you are not aware, in certain cases, what, what you think that India is uh, going in that particular direction, though definitely this is, this is going to be correct. India itself is uh, putting a lot of efforts for the biofuel. Now, what are the major outcomes of the G20? Something you must read and read everything about G20 because you are going to have at least one or two questions on G20. That is for sure in this upcoming exams. Now, this question was a uh, medium, but uh, something that you should have attempted or at least you can risk it because G20 is quite famous and something of UPSC's utmost importance. Talking a bit more about uh, G20 this time specifically, now G20 India hosted it as a first time that I told you. Please remember, this time India has invited few countries as a special guest. This time G20 becomes even more special because this time G20 we held in Kashmir. And we got certain countries like Bangladesh. Bangladesh is the only neighbor country that we have invited. Then we got Egypt, Mauritius, Netherlands, Nigeria, Oman, Singapore, Spain, UAE as a guest countries. Expect one MCQ from this part also. Probably you are you will be given some countries and they may ask that you, you know which of the following are the guest countries invited by India this time G20. So you may expect question uh, uh, about that. You we all are very well aware of the uh, the theme of this G20's presidency. India's G20 presidency theme was Vasudev Kutumkam, which is one Earth, one family, one future. Now please remember that uh, uh, China objected on this theme because this theme is a Sanskrit. Uh, uh, text it's it is in sanskrit language and sanskrit is not one of the languages uh, that is that is there it there is no provision of sanskrit language uh, for the g20 uh, thing so that's why now for the in the official declaration of the g20 we got the this particular english uh, version was adapted vasudev kutumkam was there as an alternative but since china's objection it was not adapted as an official in the official documents. So the theme is one earth, one family, one future, which is Vasudev, Vasudev Kutumkam. But for the UPSC, 
they, it, they may ask you that this particular term, this particular text, this particular line Vasudev Katumkam is from which particular ancient Sanskrit text? Then the answer has to be Maha Upanishad. From the Maha Upanishad, we have got this particular line Vasudev Kutumkam. Now major highlights of this time G20 was, now you know about that India has launched the Global Biofuel Alliance, which was the question itself. But other than bio, Biofuel Alliance, we got the most important thing was this. We have made African Union, we made it permanent member of the G20. This is probably the biggest achievement that we have done this time in G20 guys. Why? Because G20 so far had representation of only one African country and that was the South Africa. African Union, you understand because Africa is a, is a con African continent has 55, almost 54, 55 countries and it was the least represented group in G20. So now we have added African Union as a permanent member, giving more representation for Africa and by doing that, India has become even bigger leader of Global South. India had become bigger leader of global south, all the, uh, the developing countries and now India has become bigger leader by adding African Union, right? So this was a very important highlight, try to remember it. Other than that, <clears throat> we also launched one very, very, very important economic corridor. This G20 alliance we have, we have launched India to Middle East to Europe, mega economic corridor. There is a question ahead on that. We'll discuss uh, this corridor there also. And please remember if you have a direct question on New Delhi Declaration. Now UPSC sometimes asks you these kind of questions. New Delhi Declaration relates to which of the following? So it has a direct relation to G20 summit that we have hosted. So these are the four major highlights. Try to read more about G20 because UPSC is going to ask you questions on that. That is for sure guys. Question number 68 was with respect to the production linked incentive PLI scheme for IT hardware. Okay, I'm not going into the detail of the PLI. Just try to solve this question with little, of, little bit of the common sense. PLI is one particular scheme right now in the country. This is the most important scheme when it comes to boosting our exports. India wants to become net exporter country. We want to increase our export. That is no, there is no price for guessing that, right? But to boost the exports at a next level, Indian government has started this production linked incentive. Just to make you understand what exactly the meaning of production linked incentive, look at this. Now, normally just to boost our exports, when exports are going to get boosted, exports can be boosted when exports become competitive. Competitive, there has to be like they are of less price. Because in the, uh, in the foreign markets, uh, probably the, if the price is less, there is more chances of people buying your product, right? So to make the products competitive, of course, export uh, industries or, or the manufacturing units, they need government support. Normally, how government used to support, government used to give them lots of subsidies. Lots of subsidies were given in terms of taxes, in terms of electricity, in terms of other facilities, in terms of their inputs. So we used to give them a lot of subsidies, but what was happening, <coughs> companies were using the subsidies, but still they were not able to produce the quality products. Okay. Now government with the PLI has, has changed certain things. Government says, I'm not going, going to give you subsidies before, but if you are going to make product, if you are actually making, uh, uh, if you are actually manufacturing, and you are giving me quality products. So if your product is good, it is, it is of utmost quality and you are manufacturing in real sense, then you bring that product to me. I'm going to incentivize you based on your actual production so that I'm going to have the competitive exports and that actually is going to boost the country's export ecosystem. So here, here in the production linked incentive, as the name says, if you are producing it, on your production, I'm going to give you incentive. So by, because this, this concept actually is helping India's ecosystem. And today, probably if there is any scheme, which is the most important scheme for the terms of export industries, it is the PLI. And, and there are not, I just not IT hardware. There are so many, there are approximately 14 to 15 sectors of economy, pharma, mobile, um, <clears throat> food processing. There are multiple sectors which are made part of the production linked incentives. Okay, 
Now, look at this statement. P I know, I hope that PLI meaning is clear to you. Now, PLI scheme for the IT hardware. Look at the first statement. It says, PLI scheme for IT hardware is encouraging domestic manufacturing. Yes, that makes sense because PLI is about domestic manufacturing at a, at a better price and then we are going to export it. So, of course, when I am when I'm going to boost my exports, by default, my domestic manufacturing, without manufacturing, how am I going to export? No. So, export boosting automatically going to improve your domestic manufacturing. First statement makes sense. Second statement cannot be right at all because you see the PLI for the IT hardware. Is it going to be under Ministry of Heavy Industry? We are talking about IT, information technology. What IT has to do with heavy industry, sir? cannot be the case. It is always going to be the MITI, Ministry of Electronics and IT in uh, Information Technology. So, heavy industry cannot be the case because I am talking about the IT software, IT hardware, right? So, second you can eliminate by, by, uh, by default you can eliminate. Look at the third statement. It provides financial incentives to eligible companies based on their incremental sale of the product manufactured in India over a base year. Yes, of course, it's a very common statement that resembles to the uh, PLI. So, for, for solving this question, you do not need a very in-depth knowledge of the IT hardware or something. You just need to have a common sense and you can eliminate your statement. So, right answer has to be only two. It was a medium question, but something you, you could have easily att attempted based on the logic, common sense, eliminating the second point right that is important guys talking about the PLI like I told you try okay do one more thing uh, do check out right now how many total number of uh, sectors are being included in the PLI try to read about them it's it is very important plus there is one thing very important for the PLI scheme if you are if you are your production targets are way behind the uh, if you are producing below your targets even there is a there is a, a provision of penalizing the companies under the PLI scheme, if you are eligible for PLI, but if you are not producing as per your targets, there will be deduction of 10% subsidies. So it it can this scheme can also penalize you because we really want no nonsense players. We want to get the game going, okay? And remember, the ministry is uh, mighty for this. Now the question, next question 69 was with respect to the mission for integrated development of the horticulture. Now this is a very important mission in India. And under this mission, you have many submissions. One of the submission is National Horticulture Mission. There are many, many one. The question is asking you which statement is not correct. Okay, now be careful about the horticulture. Now, very first thing, guys, whenever I use the word horticulture, the word horticulture actually going to include all the fruits, the vegetables, the flowers, the spices, all of them are in general known as the horticulture. So, Mission Horticulture, it's a central sponsored scheme. Central sponsored means the funding is going to be shared between center and the states. This sector is about the holistic growth of horticulture, including the fruit, vegetable, root, tuber crops, mushrooms, spices, flower, aromatic plants, coconut, cashew, cocoa, and bamboo. Everything is a part of horticulture, like I told you. The major objective of this mission is actually that we are going to uh, you know, grow the, the horticulture sector, we are going to grow it area based, like regionally differentiated strategies are made for different different regions. And for that particular purpose, you have many submissions that I'm going to talk in the next slide. Another objective of this is basically we want to encourage our farmers to, to form more groups like uh, the FPOs, the farmer produce organizations and all, so that they, they have better bargaining power to get better price of their produce. We also want to enhance the production of the horticulture in terms of scale to ensure more income to the farmer, to ensure more nutritional security in the country. Also improving productivity and about supporting the skill development. Now under this one particular mission, there are many sub schemes like I told you and one of that scheme is National Horticulture Mission. Now please remember, there are two very close schemes. One is National Horticulture Mission including all the state and UTs except for the two states, one all the northeastern states and the Himalayan states. Why I am excluding these two? Because let me tell you guys, in India, uh, when it comes to the horticulture, 
the haughty these northeastern states of india and himalayan states himalayan states it include the jammu kashmir now it includes ladakh it includes himachal pradesh it includes uttarakhand and the seven northeastern states now these all together they are actually hub of horticulture in india so they need some special dedicated scheme so that we can we already have a very best infrastructure in terms of uh, horticulture in these particular areas and that is why for 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 better even making it better you have horticulture mission specifically dedicatedly for northeast and himalayan states and then you have other than them the rest for rest of india you have national horticulture mission so remember these two are you you have dedicated schemes and similarly you have national horticulture board including all state and the uts now you have coconut development Bo board for all coconut growing states now you have central institute for horticulture specifically dedicated to northeastern states now they, i have a question for you tell me in the comment section box how many states are considered to be coconut growing states if you know the answer i want you guys to give me the answer in the comment section box okay now if you look at the question go back to the question the first statement is fine this is correct but there is problem with the second statement it says national horticulture mission cover all the state and uts yes it cover but there is except the northeast and the himalayan states because for them we have a different mission so second is incorrect you are supposed to figure out which is not correct answer has to be two only uh, this question i would say it was it was a bit tough question because you need to have specific for first statement is fine that that makes sense and be always careful about central sponsored or central sector schemes in this question yes it was a tough one if you are not sure about it you can skip because these are very close call questions uh, generally you have uh, you know tough parameter for these questions next next uh, question was with respect to the pm kisan scheme now pradhan mantri kisan scheme is probably one of the more, most important scheme that we have right now in the country that by the by which government is supporting the farmers of this country as the name says pm kisan what exactly is pm kisan now please look at the full form first the pm kisan actually talk about the um, uh, it's a central uh, scheme central uh, sector scheme it talks about the how government is going to supplement the financial needs of the small and marginal farmer smf means the small and the marginal farmers who all are small and marginal farmers well small marginal farmers are those which are having a land holding up to 2 hectare only so just get one thing very straight this pradhan mantri kisan yojana is about supporting the small marginal farmers having less than 2 hectares of the land okay now what exactly government does in pm kisan in pm kisan government gives 6000 rupees for one entire year and it gives into three equal installment because in india we have three cropping seasons one 2000 rupees for kharif 2000 rupees for rabi and 2000 rupees for the zaid season so in three equal installments government gives 6000 rupees to the farmers of the country which farmer these particular less than two holding kind of uh, uh, farmers right now recently this scheme was in news because the pm kisan scheme recently we got a ai chatbot ai chatbot for pm kisan scheme was launched in fact this was the first ai chatbot which was integrated with one of the major flagship schemes of india the word flagship means the scheme which is of very high priority for the government that is called a flagship program okay so that that's why this scheme was in news also remember the pm kisan is a central sector scheme means 100% a funding to be given by the government of india the union is going to pay 100% rupees and when you talk about the ministry be careful and very clear pm kisan yojana is implemented by ministry of agriculture cooperation and farmer welfare that is the that is what it uh, you know the ministry is now if you look at the question now we look at the question now you have the very first statement says ai chatbot for pm kisan launched yes with a major flagship so we have got it and try to remember it because for the first time some something big technological thing has been attached to a government scheme so chatbots are important and these chatbots are actually going to farmers uh, going to help the farmers in more realistic manner these chatbots are going to uh, uh, you know 
uh, you know they are going to answer the queries daily queries of the of the farmers in their own languages so so that there is better passing of the messages through the ai chatbots and actually helping the farmers at a grassroots level now the second statement is again correct the beneficiaries of pm kisan are small marginal farmers having up to 2 hect hectares of the of the land that is correct but look at the objective do i did i tell you the pm kisan yojana has objective of providing energy and water security to the farmer is it about enhancing their income is it about de dieselize the farm sector no these are objectives of a very different scheme so we have a scheme very similar name called pm kusum don't get confused between pm kisan and pm kusum pm kusum is pradhan mantri kisan urja suraksha means energy security that scheme talks about the energy security of the farmer right and in that particular scheme pm kusa, kusum yojana we have all these uh, uh, you know all these provisions of how we can de dieselize means we are going to uh, reduce the use of diesels in the farm sector we want to reduce the environmental pollution from the farming industry we want to provide energy and water security to the farmers that is a pm kusum scheme so don't get confused pm kisan is about supporting them giving 6000 rupees uh, to the farmers of the country at three equal installments so third is not correct answer has to be only two i think this was a medium question but uh, you could have easily attempted it even even if you if you look at the objectives uh, you you could make out that you know pm kisan because it's a very famous scheme uh, giving 6000 rupees so something you could have risked it uh, because uh, this was a question with respect to two particular schemes so be careful about the objective any time you read about the scheme uh, you know be very careful with the objectives the next question is with respect to project naman now talking about the project naman so project naman it it tells you uh, about increasing the agriculture productivity in rural areas it is not project naman providing healthcare services is again not project naman Pro promoting entrepreneurship no project naman relates to facilitation grievance redressal of the veterans families of deceased personnel by indian army answer has to be b now i would say this was a tough question because there is absolutely no clue it's a it's a pure fact based question if you know it then only attempt it otherwise skip because you do not really have a uh, have a uh, you know margin of playing any guess here it's a straight forward question what exactly project naman is so you know in, uh, in our uh, in our defense forces project naman is a new initiative which is started by indian army it is going to provide facilitation and uh, grievance redressal centers for all the veterans and the kin or, or the family members of the of, of those personals who actually lost their life they have laid down the life for the as a supreme sacrifice for the country now under the project naman we are going to create lot of common service centers and we are going to give a range of services to the relatives of those uh, veterans you know with respect to the pension related services medical services even any uh, if there is any grievance redressal or education employment assistance everything is to be provided through the project naman to all the relatives of those persons laying li laying their life for the country under the project naman we have a sparsh portal also sparsh portal is implemented by ministry of defense with specifically with respect to any grievances any problem with respect to the pensions and disbursement requirement that is with respect to the armed forces in fact all armed forces army navy air force and even defense civilians right so try to remember project naman its objective and why it was created talking about the next question now this we already have discussed i told you that it was g20 summit when india initiated this uh, this new corridor called india middle east europe economic corridor imec now i do expect uh, a question on this because it's a very important connectivity corridor I imagine what we are going to do we are going to connect india uh, with whole of the middle east the the arab arab countries and we are going to connect us to the europe now this is a very important uh, connectivity i would say it's a mega economic corridor mega connectivity corridor because this is our answer this is going to counter 
the very famous China's BRI. You have the China's Belt Road Initiative. So we really want to counter that because China's BRI is their a green ticket that they are going to spread the influence in the world uh, under the BRI they are also trying to connect China uh, till Europe uh, via Middle East and, and also to the to the African countries but to counter China's BRI infrastructure this is this BRI is also called as one belt one road initiative of China and since 2013 China aggressively has promoted its project now it's time for us to counter it and we have proposed the India, India Middle East Europe uh, economic corridor, right? Now look at, now you need to have certain knowledge uh, about it, but be careful. The question was with respect to which statement is not correct, okay? So be careful about it. Now if you look at the, uh, of this particular project, look at the project guys. This India Middle East Europe economic corridor starting from India going till Europe and in Europe we have included Greece because Greece is considered to be the gateway of Europe. If you reach Greece, you are easily going to get into the Europe and that is we are connecting the corridor till Greece as the last connecting point. This is a network of transport corridors. It's an economic corridor. It, it is also a connectivity corridor. Why we, we have made it? We want to increase the connectivity and if you are increasing and improving the connectivity by default, you are going to do more economic integration of all these particular areas. In fact, when I talk about the connectivity, this project has two interesting economic corridors. It is going to use the railway lines. It is also going to use the sea lines. I would say it is going to be a multimodal, right? It is a multimodal project using railway lines and the sea lines of the communication. It is going to have two separate corridors. One is when India and uh, Europe, we are going to connect as an east corridor connecting India to the West Asia. From West Asia to the to the um, Europe, we are going to have the North Corridor. So try to remember them also. These, these are two are important. And when it was announced, already you know it was announced during the G20 summit. Now please remember one more part of it, this. This particular IMEC, this particular IMSE corridor, it's a part of partnership for global infrastructure investment. This particular partnership was actually a joint initiative to fund infrastructure projects in the developing countries. It was launched by G7 countries about which we already have discussed. So G7 countries, they want to develop infrastructure in the developing countries. And again, G7 also tries to counter this. Again, they were, they were trying to counter the China's BRI only, right? So G7 started helping uh, developing countries so that the, the, the developing countries don't get into the dead trap of the Chinese people and they started uh, promoting it and they for that purpose they have created this partnership for global infrastructure investment. So our IMEC is actually part of that particular investment group initiated by G7. Now what we are planning, we are planning to connect India to Europe and for that purpose we are going to connect India, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, Greece, you have seen the entire map yourself. Now what makes one thing very important for us? Now you may have a question on that also. You may have a question, which Indian ports are going to be connected by IMEC project? So in India, we have the Mundra port of Gujarat. You have the Kandla or Deen Dayal port of Gujarat once again, and Jawaharlal Nehru port trust, which is called the JNPT of Navi Mumbai. So these three ports become really important for you to prepare because they are going to be part of IMSE project. You may have India oriented question on that uh, also, right? Now look at the question. If you look at these uh, 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 three statements, every statement looks perfectly fine for us. Which statement is not correct? Everything is correct. So answer has to be none. Very straightforward question. Very fact based question, medium, but something you could have attempted because uh, I told you G20 initiatives are something you must and must prepare. There is no choice for that. Uh, G20 is going to be a very important a part of the upcoming prelims exam. Next question is with respect to the Tista River. Tista River, uh, let me tell you, if you look at the previous year questions, you already have uh, in few of the UPSC prelims, last uh, seven, eight year, 10 year prelims, <coughs> you have questions already being asked on Tista River. So expect questions on Tista River once more because Tista River is one of the, uh, you have a little bit of uh, you know, tussle between the country India and Bangladesh. 
it is still one of the uh, unresolved issue the sharing of the water of the tista river still one of the unresolved issue between india and bangladesh so these two countries have resolved most of the issues but tista river sharing is still something we are yet to take up and finalize so is tista a tributary of brahmaputra yes it is a, a tributary of uh, tista is is a tributary of brahmaputra we know that very well it says it originates um, in eastern himalayas near the chungtang in sikkim yes it is it's a trans boundary river it is a trans boundary river it starts from sikkim goes to west bengal from west bengal it goes to bangladesh so very simple statements with respect to tista simple answer has to be d123 should have attempted very easily but some more information i want you to i want to give you with respect to tista now why this tista was in news very recently again i told you uh, that uh, uh, in between india bangladesh there is a tussle over the river sharing you know very well a person called medha patkar she was the leader of narmada bachao andolan right now that particular leader medha patkar has recently urged the west bengal government to agree to share the water of tista river with with uh, uh, bangladesh and that is why it was in news and the activist medha patkar she actually referred to the helsinki rules now these are the very important rules uh, whenever there is any trans boundary river any trans boundary river be it interstate river or inter country river every time it's a, if, if there is a trans boundary river how water sharing is to be done is based on helsinki rules so what exactly helsinki rules i'll tell you uh, a little later in this video but remember about the tista river uh, you can see on the map it is originating from sikkim now becomes a part of brahmaputra brahmaputra itself is known as jamuna in bangladesh right now this river is the largest river of sikkim and second largest river of west bengal after river ganga uh, originating originating point is fine uh, this is absolutely correct now helsinki rule some uh, what is helsinki helsinki is actually capital of finland okay it is the capital of finland 1966 there was a there was a convention there was a treaty that was signed in helsinki now today it is known as helsinki rules and let's say let's expect you have a different mcq on this also so helsinki rule relates to which of the following so directly you can ask you you can give the answer helsinki rules are with respect to use of the water of the international rivers so specifically how international river water are going to be shared for that purpose we have the helsinki rules and since it is it is about india and bangladesh now that become international waters for that purpose we have the helsinki rules right but remember these rules are non binding upsc may trick you by saying okay these are binding rules they are non binding uh, rules that we have okay now the key principles that we use in the helsinki uh, rules the key principles which are utilized are based on these things there has to be equitable utilization of water between the two countries no harm to the basin area water resources cooperation data sharing dispute resolution and there has to be prevention of the rules now you may have an mcq on this also which of the following are the principles used by helsinki rules for international uh, wa uh, river water sharing so you you expect these kind of questions because every question becomes relevant if it is with respect to indian context sometime right now the next question number 74 is a very current based question now you you know about this recent event when canadian prime minister accused india that india has some involvement with respect to the murder of a khalistani separatist uh, Har hardeep singh nijjar and for that matter india canada relation relationship becomes very important for you for your upsc exam even for the mains exam also not just the prelims pre as well as mains do prepare india canada relationship it's it's going to be on the radar of upsc now which statement is not correct that is something you have to talk okay <clears throat> let's say i do not know the facts but i can still i know about india canada i know lot of people uh, of india they migrate to canada especially people from from uh, punjab from gujarat even from haryana a lot of people are going to canada these days right so first let's talk about the first statement india canada bilateral relations now they were elevate, elevated to the strategic partnership in 2015 now year may be a bit problematic thing but yes when you have you have a relationship of so many indians going to canada there has to be 
some kind of special strategic partnership. Now you see Canada hosts one of the largest Indian diasporas of the world. There are almost 7 lakh NRIs and 1.6 million people of Indian origin that actually live in Canada. So definitely the two countries, they had elevated their uh, relationship at a, as, a, as a strategic partnership, right? But <clears throat> look at the second statement. Have you ever heard Canada as being one of the top five trading partners? Now there, there is a gap. Despite this cl close relationship of migration between India and Canada, the trade is still not at its peak or we are still not utilizing uh, the potentials of the trade between the two countries. So India's total trade with Canada is still less than expected. So India now has become the 10th largest trading partner but this potential can be increased in future. Though Canada is one of the India's largest source of pulses let me tell you of the total pulses that India imports almost 30% pulses are coming from Canada. For that matter Canada is important. But there is a potential of increasing the trade between the two countries. And for that matter, we have started way back in 2008 and 2010. We started, we proposed and thought and we started the negotiations for India-Canada Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, CEPA. Recently, India has done the CEPA with UAE. India has done this kind of uh, agreement with Australia as well. But for Canada... It is still pending. We have still not mobilized or finalized it. It's a long pending project of 14 years, right? Maybe in future we can do that. But right now, of course, the potential is underutilized. So think of the first as a correct one. And it says India is the fifth largest trading partner. No, we have not heard that kind of, uh, uh, you know, economic boom or economic exchange between India and Canada. So second is not correct. Which is not correct? The second has to be not correct. It was a medium one. But I can, I'm not sure about the figures, but I can still attempt the question with a common sense. Because we know in the current affairs, we, we read about India's bilateral partner, like the kind of level of business we have with China, level of trade, trade we have with, with the Arab country, with the, with the Saudi, with the UAE, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, economic relations we have with USA. We don't have that much with Canada, right? The next question is a very straightforward question. Gray list, black list one of the most famous organization that is Financial Action Task Force. FATF, very, very important when it comes to money laundering or when it comes to terror financing. These two, you anytime you think of these two things, money laundering, you have to stop. Terror financing, you have to stop. You always look up to FATF, which is Financial Action Task Force. This was set up at the initiative of G7 countries. So this was an easy question. Must have attempted because... Because recently, the blacklist and grey list was very much in news. Because, because Pakistan was put on the grey list and it was on grey list since 2018. Now recently, Pakistan had now had come out of this grey list, but it was because of Pakistan. It was in news. The two lists were in news very much. First of all, you need to, you need to know about the FATF force. What is a FATF Financial Action Task Force? Established 1989 during the G7 summit in Paris. This initial mandate of the FATF was just to prevent the money laundering in this world. Later on in 2001, the mandate was expanded and then other than money laundering, it was also asked to take care of the terror financing in the world because during 2001 onwards, there was, there was a massive uh, level of terror financing that was happening. Now, it, it actually sees these two right now. Now, any country who is not doing well in these two terms, now FATF has a procedure. If it find any country as a safe heaven for supporting terror funding or it says, okay, this country is probably a country which is a safe heaven for the money laundering. First, FATF gives them a warning that, okay, I think your country is becoming a safe heaven for that these two things so better you improve your laws and implementation and all that right so as a warning it puts the country on a gray list it's a warning list for that purpose pakistan was in uh, gray list for a long time right now it has come out right now you have countries like syria and yemen they are on the gray list but if a country becomes non cooperative if a country is not willing to listen to FATF, not at all willing to change any of the modus operandus, 
then it is going to put that country into blacklist. Right now, you have the countries like North Korea, Iran, even Myanmar. They are currently on the blacklist of the FATF. Now, try to remember the countries. Important. Grey list has approximately 12-13 countries. So, try to remember the name of the countries. Important. And please uh, be careful. Pakistan is no more on the grey list. It was, but no more uh, on the blacklist. Uh, on the grey list. FATF has, has given 26 tasks. To Pakistan to accomplish and they have recent recently accomplished those 26 tasks now they have been removed what happens when a country gets onto blacklist why it is so scary for any country to be on the FATF blacklist if you by chance get onto the blacklist of the FATF you are going to have no financial aid from IMF World Bank ADB or for that matter any multilateral development bank you are not going to get any financial aid Plus, you are also going to face a lot of international economic and financial sanctions and restrictions. So, so to be on the blacklist is probably the nightmare for any country and it is going to cut you economic, economically from the world. Okay, simple question, straightforward question. Question 76 was with respect to the Abraham Accords. Probably these are very important accords. They, they are in news for, for many, many purposes. Now, Abraham Accords, okay, now <clears throat> before I talk about Abraham Accords, you, you must be aware of the, the term Abraham. Abraham, you have Abrahamic religions, right? So, you have three religions of today, the Christianity, Islam and Judaism. These three religions, collectively, they have a common ancestor called Abraham. And that's why these three are called as Abrahamic religions, okay? So, try to remember that into the mind. And you know about the Abraham Accords a lot because they were in news. Abraham Accord is basically about normalizing the relations between Israel being a Jewish country and the Arab world. Because the time Israel, you know, even today, there are a lot of Arabic countries, they do not recognize the existence of Israel. They don't recognize Israel as a country. So Israel is the only Jewish country and Israel is surrounded by a lot of Arab countries. And you must have heard about the six day war that Israel has fought against uh, the supreme Arab nations of that time. Now, right now to normalize the relations of Israel with Arab countries, we, uh, the United States of America has brokered, has started these so-called Abraham Accords. So right now Abraham Accord, it, it is an agreement for normalizing relation between Israel and the four Arab countries. And out of these four, in 2020, Israel had signed the Abraham Accord with UAE and Bahrain, these two. And later on subsequently, Morocco and Sudan, they also become part of these uh, Abraham Accords. Okay, this is important. And who is the broker, who is the mediator here? It was, the Abraham Accords were actually pushed by Donald Trump. When, when Donald Trump was US President, he pushed the Abraham Accords at a very uh, high scale. Please remember, Whenever I use the word Arab, Arab world or Arab countries, I use this word, it has 22 countries. You can think of any, every country of Middle East and North Africa with two exceptions. There are 22 countries as Arab countries, but please never ever include Iran or Turkey. These two are not Arab countries because they have their primary language as a different language. All the, Abraham, all the Arab countries they have Arabic as their common language. But Turkey, you have the Turkish language and in Iran, you have the Farsi language. So let's say if you have a question, which of the following are part of the Arabic, Arabic countries? Do not include uh, uh, Iran or Turkey. They are not considered to be part of the Arab countries. So just try to keep that into the mind, right? That's, this is important. So if you look at this question, what it says, Abraham Accord, it is about normalizing relations between Israel, Arab countries. Yes. Which four countries? Try to remember the name that I just discussed. 2020, it was between UAE uh, and uh, Bahrain. And yes, subsequently, these two countries were added. So be very careful about the countries. Uh, UPSC may trick, trick you, uh, you know, with respect to changing the names. It may add Iraq here, may add Saudi Arabia here. So be very careful with the names. Because these are very specific names, you, you cannot be factually incorrect with that. Here both statements are correct, answer has to be C. I would see this is a very easy question, something you could have attempted because uh, Abraham Accords are very famous, very much in the news, a very important part of your current affairs. 
talking about the international tribunal for laws of the sea now this is a very important question you are supposed to figure out not correct international tribunal of for the law of the sea what exactly this itlos is first we discuss that so you must have heard about the united nation convention on the laws of the sea this is one of the most and probably a very important uh, convention when it comes to the rules and regulations of the waters unclos simply also called as laws of the sea they are they are responsible how they are going to categorize the waters and they have to they have to maintain the international relations between the countries with respect to their territorial uh, with respect to their maritime rights so every country has certain maritime rights every country has uh, their rights in in terms of uh, the territorial waters and all these uh, exclusive economic zone high sea and all right for that matter you must have heard about uncols in 1982 this uh, convention was started now this particular convention has established an independent judicial body this convention established independent judicial body by the name of international tribunal for the laws of the sea so one thing you can understand and remember that overall the itlos it works under the unclos fine this is this makes sense international tribunal laws of the sea has 21 independent judges and um, very interestingly the seat of the itlos in the city of hamburg which is in germany now why it was in news recently because there is a group of nine small island states nine small island countries they actually they were seeking protection of the world ocean from the catastrophic climate change because we know because of the climate change the worst effect is going to be on the island countries you know the all the islands are at the utmost risk because of the climate change more glaciers will melt sea level is going to rise oceans are going to be submerged first so island countries are at the front risk when it comes to climate change and for that matter these the nine these nine island states they have they actually reach out to international tribunal for laws of the sea to determine if the carbon dioxide emissions absorbed by the oceans can be considered pollution and if so what obligations countries has have to prevent it so for that matter this was in news this is important for all of us right now remember one thing that the uh, itlos has a jurisdiction over disputes that also concern unclos and matters provided by any agreement now what exactly and all okay remember this very important thing like i told you about un convention laws of the sea which talks about the safeguarding the marine environment and protecting the freedom of scientific research on the high seas and it has it has three very important institutes under it you have international tribunal for laws of the sea for any disputes you have international seabed authority basically it gives for all the marine resources all the marine resources for its mining exploration you have to give per, you have to get permission from isa and then you have commission on limit of the continental shelf now you you expect this mcq also they may give you these three names and they will they will ask you these three belongs to which of the following group so the answer has to be uncols so try to remember these three they are very very important uh, uh, subsidiary sub uh, bodies under the convention of laws of, of the sea right now first statement is absolutely correct second is also absolutely correct uh, the third statement says the third statement says it has jurisdiction over this yes it is so which is not correct answer has to be d because all statements are correct with respect to international tribunal for laws of sea now this question is was a tough one it was a tough question you do not have really any uh, scope of using elimination you don't have any scope of uh, wiping off the wrong uh, answers there is because it is it is all based on facts so you can risk it in case you have little bit of knowledge otherwise don't risk you can skip these kind of questions because they are hardcore questions based on the facts and talking about the uncols it is famous in the world because united nation convention laws of the sea actually give us the maritime zones you must have heard about the territorial sea the first 12 nautical miles then from the baseline the coastline you have uh, contiguous zone up to 24 nautical miles 
till 200 nautical miles you have exclusive economic zone and every area beyond 200 nautical miles we call it as international water or the high seas right <coughs> so uh, all these zones are actually done by or divided by the united nation convention okay the next question is with respect to the malvia mission okay now please understand you know about madan mohan malvia malvia mission has a name from madan mohan malvia and we know of madan mohan malvia was a great name when it comes to indian education system he was a great leader we know about that so keep that into mind and then you can think about the uh, the malvia mission the malvia mission stand uh, derived name from madan mohan malvia it's a, it's a teacher training program which is launched by ugc in collaboration with ministry of education now these are important points which particular ministry who are the partners so madan mohan malviya mission is about teacher training but that is by the collaboration of the two ministry of education and ugc ugc is uh, is uh, and you 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 heard of ugc Uni university grant commission now since ugc is involved think logically if ugc involved for teachers of which particular class i am going to talk about ugc means i am going to talk of, about the teachers in the higher educational institutions hai na because ugc is about the higher education your colleges universities right now for that matter we have uh, both online offline components and uh, the the teachers are going to get trained if you look at the question guys be aware of the question it says malvi mission is a teacher program launched by department of higher education was the department of higher education there no it was the ugc along with the ministry of education and since you're talking about ugc yes it is about the higher education uh, uh, institutions and why you would train your teacher obviously for improving the quality of education right so second is correct but the first one is not correct so right, which answer is correct answer has to be b it was this question was again a medium level question you could have solved it uh, <clears throat> because uh, madan mohan malvi mission is a important mission for teacher training program in your pdf there is a there are details of uh, madan mohan malvi that you can read about uh, because his contributions are great you know he was a principal founder of uh, banaras hindu university and uh, he was also he started a very famous uh, newspaper called the leader so of course he his contribution uh, is definitely of very high very high rank in terms of india's education system the next question is with respect to national air quality index now national air quality index you know that it monitors eight pollutants right eight pollutants are measured now which of them is not considered as an air quality uh, pollutant under the national ambient air quality standards so please be very careful people think that carbon dioxide is a pollute pollution gas carbon dioxide is actually relates more to global uh, greenhouse gas carbon monoxide is more pollutant not carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is not considered when it comes to the air quality index in india which are those eight so it includes the pm particulates of course the pm 2.5 pm 10 you have led it also includes carbon monoxide but not the carbon dioxide please remember it so you have a whole list because air quality index is something which is very important and you know the air quality index is a number which is measured for the air quality in india the the total number is from 0 to 500 the higher the number the worse the air quality so number has to be minimum air quality index was started by the ministry of environment and forest climate change in 2014 air quality index was started as a part of swachh bharat campaign eight pollutants which are being measured includes the two particulate matters the nitrogen dioxide sulfur dioxide carbon monoxide be very careful not carbon dioxide carbon monoxide ozone ground level ozone is a pollution pollution only stratospheric uh, ozone is useful for us but ozone at it in troposphere is very big pollution pollutant that we have and ozone ammonia and lead right now please just to give you bit more information all the air quality index has a coloring scheme it has coloring scheme based on the uh, number that you are getting as an aqi you have certain six categories if the air quality is good satisfactory moderate poor very poor and severe 
and you have a specific color code also now upsc asked the question about the color codes of cyclone i think <clears throat> they have asked about it so even in the mains exam you have got this one particular question where upsc was asking about the color codes uh, of the cyclones as well so you you can expect a question on the color codes of air quality and for every uh, category you have possible health impacts also so remember the colors try to remember the possible health impacts and the name of the category as well so this question probably become very important for your upcoming upsc prelims as well as mains that i can say now question number 80 was with respect to urban infrastructure development fund called uidf which statement is correct is something you have to prepare now this question um okay now before i before i get into the detail look at the statement number 1 look at the name name is about urban infrastructure okay so think about urban infrastructure which ministry do you think is going to be the part of urban infrastructure of course it is going to be ministry of uh, housing and urban affair yes or no urban ministry of housing and urban affair is going to create urban infrastructure where do you want to create urban infrastructure you have the urban areas are are categorized as tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 right you must have heard about that the tier 1 to 3 are based on the population size every city having 10 lakh plus population is called as tier 1 city tier 2 city has between 1 lakh to 10 lakh population and if the population is between 50000 to 1 lakh that is called tier 3 just apply your common sense in which area i i need government support for creating my urban infrastructure if a city has t1 tier 1 category they must already must be having the good urban infrastructure so urban infrastructure push is not going to be required in tier 1 cities they already have a good urban infrastructure that is why they have a population of 10 lakh plus so it is only with t2 and the t3 cities tier 2 tier 3 cities i need to have government push for urban infrastructure yes or no so this statement is wrong i could have easily attempted this by applying my common sense look be careful about small small details of the question first is incorrect second is correct ministry of housing affairs and this fund is managed by national housing bank that makes very much sense to me now of course the third and fourth is bit more technical these three can the third and fourth cannot be solved without a proper knowledge for you right now the third statement is important because it says the cities can get a loan at a rate of 1.5% less than the prevailing bank interest rate of course we want to incentivize the loans we want cities to take the loans more and more for the infrastructure projects and that's why under this uh, scheme under this fund the government gives cities a discount uh, loans at a 1.5% less than the prevailing bank interest rate okay that makes sense but if it exactly 1.5 or not now this fact you have to remember because it could be anything right there is no logic behind it now please be very careful any time you are taking any loan under the uidf scheme that particular fund cannot be used for these particular things it can be used for other purpose but it must not be cannot be used for maintenance work or administrative expenses cannot be used for housing urban transport or power telecom health and, edu and, and education project because these are already covered uidf talks about other infrastructure development not about these particular one which are already there if these would not have been there i would not have calling them cities or the towns yes road transport housing urban transport power telecom they this already is there uidf is basically targeting those areas which are being ignored so in this case the first is incorrect second third are correct but look at the fourth the fund is mainly used for housing transport in fact housing transport is not included as a part of uidf so this answer has to be two only two yes i would say this question was a tough one that especially the third and fourth statement was a tough uh if you have no idea better to skip rather than taking unnecessary risk i hope you have enjoyed the entire set of discussion with me guys and this is all from my side in the part number 4 i hope you have got better insights about this uh, these uh, questions now i'll see you guys in the part number 5 with the remaining 20 questions best wishes from my side that's all 
and uh, don't forget to check out the link of the test series given in the description box. I'm always welcome for the feedbacks. Do tell me the feedback and how you like this video and uh, stay tuned with PMFIS. Take care. God bless you. Jai Hind.